that was the sun. Right. Right? Right. And so that is the circle that has to happen again. And it has to happen because the community drives it. There's no amount of federal funding that's going to do it. It's going to have to be driven by a community who wants to be a community. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. Welcome to my channel. Hey, yo, hey, yo. Listen up. Listen up. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. The wireless woman. And tonight on Soul, part two of a conversation between James Baldwin and Dickie Giovanni. You know, mm -hmm. we are in great trouble, but we have the great advantage of knowing we're in great trouble. You know, we're in trouble we man to woman, man to man. We're in trouble, you know, father to son, mother to daughter. But we know we are. You will see and hear two very gifted and much loved black writers thinking, questioning, and exchanging ideas with all the eloquence and wit and passion that have brought them to national and indeed international are prominent. How do we as a people begin to, to deal? What we have with to do, it? and it's a very difficult uphill uphill road, up, uphill, uphill job, Nikki. What you have what you have to do is begin to change the basis on which people think. Welcome to all of my Wi-Fi's. Welcome to another episode of The Wireless Woman, where I have a very special guest, Sir Elliot Axiom. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. I hadn't realized I was knighted yet, but I will accept it from you, Queen. Absolutely, absolutely. The Queen has chosen her champion. And that would be you, Sir Elliot Axiom. And I do so accept. And I could go on and on about your accolades and tell everyone how much of an impact you have made on me as an artist. However, I'm going to allow you, even though, you know, I give you a little bit of zhuzh, but I'm going to allow you to introduce yourself just so that I don't miss or leave anything out. The little Wi-Fi, my name is... Elliot Axiom, I am a poet, spoken word artist. Those two things are different. An educator and an activist. Um, I'm a teacher by profession. I am an artist by passion. And I am pleased to be here today on The Wireless Woman. You are Clark Kent by day, <laughs> and you are Super Axiom by night. So depends on the night, but yeah, we'll, we'll work on that. Yes. Yeah, so the honor is definitely mine to have you here, but we will share it. We will partake of it. I think that's your idea. So, in my honest opinion, introductions fail you. They do. They do. So if you don't mind, I would love to hear an excerpt from one of your masterful spoken word pieces. No pressure at all. No pressure. <laughs> this, is, this was completely scripted. Yeah. You know, I'm, I think I might have something that might be a little fit into what we have going on. Perfect. We do not recognize the divinity within us. We take for granted the wings forming inside of our cocoon bodies. Believe that all we have to do is be still and they will grow. We don't understand that for this metamorphosis to occur, for these pupil frail mortal casings to crack open for our backs to split, allowing those flight permitting appendages to unfurl in order for us to fly to new worlds. First, we must nourish and strengthen the limbs, bodies, and souls we already possess. Rewrite our autobiographies every morning. Proofread them every evening until our story is complete. So let this day be our next chapter, first verse, line one, first word, God. All that follows is a prayer. Please help us 
crawl, to walk, walk, to jog, jog, to run, run, to sprint, sprint, until the wind has to run to keep up with you. Now verse it. So the lack of wind in your chest makes you sprint to run, run to jog, jog to walk, walk to crawl, rest. This is not the meaning of life, but the pace at which we should chase our dreams. A meditation in preparation for flying out of secondhand stars blocked, feet on fire, blistering bottoms, bleeding but bouncing with boundless energy, arms extended, L bent, piston pumping, cheek to chin legs, 13 steps, kick, jump over your hurdle, if not, run through it. By any means, win. By any means necessary. Thank you, thank you. I have to tell you, you have such a mastery of using your words to create that imagery because I, like you, was also a track runner. And there are indeed 13 steps yes. <laughs> between now, hurdles. Now, let's, let's not get confused. I did not run track. <laughs> I threw the discus and shot run. However, Over. when I did do that poem, mm -hmm. I did the research, mm -hmm. and I remember talking to our, you know, yes. track runners, and it is thirteen steps, and they're painstaking steps because if you miss one or you miscalculate one, you are hitting a hurdle, you are impeding your progress. So yes, yes, as a, I, I did a, I did a, a small stint <laughs> as a hurdler, uh, and I hit a couple. And, and that let me know the hurdles were not for me. Understood. Yes. But that was actually when writing that piece, it was it was twofold. It was a dichotomy mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Because I was an athlete. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to make it generalizable. Mm -hmm. And so that whole people have seen hurdles. Yeah. So they know that those steps and then they know the hurdle. And they've seen enough, you know. Videos where somebody has hit or run through a hurdle. Yeah, and that's what all art should do. You know, it should bring us to the places of convergence, of intersectionality. Like you said, even if you're not an athlete, mm -hmm. you understand the analogy. Right. So I loved <laughs> that you picked a piece that was very relevant to what we're doing today. So I myself have never done this on my own channel. Well, we have something brand new <laughs> of the world premiere, premiere, premiere. Um, Y'all might not be old enough to remember that, but that's how we used to, and they, they used to introduce the, the new hotness. And I'm sure we're about to get some new hotness. So. Well, it's, it's some old hotness, but it's some classic Hotness, you yeah. know, yeah. that never goes out of style. Classics never go out of style. So this is just so that we can both put our credentials out there. Yes. This is me reading from my novel, Just In Case. But, you, but the one thing that you and I have in common is being erotic writers. This is also um, true. I'm not sure if I'm going to be as... PG-13 as you were, but we are going to find out, aren't we? <laughs> we're going in hot, evidently. <laughs> That's what... Please, tell me. Okay, so... I would ask where you've been, but... Hetzichet said, She stands at my door with a frown on her face and presses a brown paper bag of groceries towards my chest. Her eyebrows wrinkle into an expression of concern. It's genuine. With her, it always is. Hatshepsut's mother was a pro-black, fist-raised type of woman who named her daughter after the first female pharaoh to ever rule over Egypt. Of course, Hatshepsut Duval is sensitive about her name, mostly because ignorant niggas, not Nubians, who don't know their own history have been picking on her and mispronouncing it her whole life. Me, I call her she. I met her maybe a year and a half ago. I delivered a package to her job. She's a nurse at Innovations Healthcare. She signed for the package, and after I threw a few vague hints, she gave me her number. I knew early on, after only about a week, that I wanted her to be mine. She, her, me, mine. 
I call her she because she's everything to me. I love her, but she doesn't know it. Your mom told me the where, but what I don't understand is why, she says, stepping into my apartment. I kiss her thick lips. I can't help myself. It would be useless to try to stop. She lets my lips greet her for a moment before pulling away and heading straight for my kitchen. I close the door and follow behind her like a sheep. She is the only one who has ever been here in my home, in my bed. She's the only one that's worthy of laying her head next to mine. She has met my dukes and is the only one who bears her seal of approval. She is the only one, period. So it's, it's a short little excerpt out of the chapter, but to give it a little context, mm -hmm. because novels are different than poems. Mm -hmm. He is a subtly playalistic Cadillac <laughs> funky music. He is a player in every sense of the word. And I think just as a woman, because of course this was written from a male first person perspective. Mm. And so many people didn't think I could pull it off. Okay. But this is my best selling book because I did. I did pull it off. But he is, I think when we as women encounter this type of man, we tend to think there's some sort of deficit in character, like they're incapable of loving that causes them to have these shallow relationships with women. But more often than not, there is someone there in that place. Now, for for many reasons, it may have been, you know, a star-crossed lover. You know, it, there may have been, um, you know, a loss of love. That person, they may feel that person is out of their league like he does in this book. But generally, someone's taking up that space that doesn't really allow that man to be able to invest himself fully in these other relationships. That's interesting. Yeah. And so when you encounter him, you wouldn't think he was capable of, of that type of tenderness towards a woman. And it's not until we encounter she in chapter 13 mm -hmm. that you find out why he's kind of playing this this losing game, if you will. You think that there's space of deficit? Is it only a romantic or an eros love? that could fill that space and why other women can't fill it? Could it be her mama? I'm asking the author, <laughs> not making any assumptions. Yeah, but you know, my books and my characters, they they own themselves. The, the, the reader is the owner of the interpretation. Mm. So if you ask me, I'm going to always funnel my opinion of Justin, just in case, through my experiences with men. And these are a lot of the explanations that we don't get. So my books are a conversation piece because at the essence is the unanswered questions that a lot of women have. For me, the book was cathartic and it was therapeutic because I never got the answers like that's that clueless look that you see on my face mm -hmm. but this was a man that i encountered that i could never quite get the bead on and so in order to put that story to close that chapter in my life and put it to rest i needed an explanation that made sense to me mm. i'm glad you put that last part in that explanation that made sense to me because as a man who has been on the other side of that, mm -hmm. who has put forth, you know, this incredible effort, you know, this, you know, she would like that and she'll do this and I'm going to be authentic and I'm doing that. And to not have that reciprocated and never understand why. Hi. And the saddest part being that in situations like that, a lot of times, the answer doesn't make sense. No. Period. No. It will never make sense to you. And that can be worse than, than not knowing. Than not knowing, yeah. Because then your, your whole mindset is now trying to figure out 
why in the world this stupid reason kept us from being together? Yeah, but then I think, and this is my personal mm -hmm. opinion, like I said, to me. But then I think that men go out into the world and project that onto other relationships because it is my longstanding belief, <laughs> Wrigley's believe it or not, that men have a deeper capacity to love one woman than even women do. I think men are by nature, this has just been my experience. Now, this is the unhurt, undisappointed, untapped love of a man. I think they have the propensity to love one woman in a much deeper way than women are conditioned to love for social reasons. And that is why I chose to explore that in that way. I think so often we've, we've traveled down the rabbit hole, but I think so mm -hmm. often that women are not... That women don't get to explore images of men really loving women. I mean, that's not even how black men are characterized, like in the media. It's that serial playboy like mm. image that more often than not that that person who destroys relationships, um, who's at fault for the demise of relationships. That's the way that we explore that story more often than not. I agree. Right. Men, particularly black men, are seen as super player, super playboy, um, abuser, uh, come home only, you know, after I'm done with the streets type dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I wanted, if nothing else, to categorize that because I myself, as a black woman, have been loved very deeply. I think... Um, the encounters that I have had with black men who have who have found me to be so charming, endearing, and loving is is a representation of the love that I've been shown. You know, <laughs> we have come through some we have come through something, you know. And if we can get this far, we can get further. You know, and we got this far by, by means which no one understands, including you and me. It brings us to the reason why we both find ourselves here. We are here to reconstruct the 1971 discussion between Nikki Giovanni, the poet, mm. the spoken word artist, word and James Baldwin, the author, which I fit the bill. As long as the assumptions are the same, nothing will change. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So we must corner ourselves to make a new assumption. Okay, I buy it. It's kind of a role reversal, mm -hmm. but I think that we still each have enough mastery of being able to articulate thoughts that are personal to us in a transmutable way mm -hmm. to be able to now, a little over, what is it, 50 years later? Yeah, about. Yeah, 50 71 years. 71 to 20, yeah, 50 years, 51. 51 years later. Wow. I think that, that 51 years hits me so hard because everything they were talking about in the original discourse mm -hmm. is still so fresh, new, and relevant. As if it's never gone away. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with so much time elapsing, you would think we would be able to evolve the discussion, which is still what I hope to do here today right. but it's just still seeing how poignantly relevant it is I agree and I would also say and I, and I don't want to be the dead horse but also to look at the fact that within those 51 years not much has changed no no I, I don't think we would find it so relevant if there had been significant changes and to go even a little further that the problems have been constant, mm -hmm. almost as if it were by design. <laughs> hold the phone, hold the phone, baby. You know, it has begun. Something has begun. The fact that we're talking about it is a beginning. It's very important. You know, it's very important indeed. All right, Elliot. Thank you.
the the love that we share with each other is not the purpose for which we are here. Because <laughs> even though we fuck out all day, we came here to discuss the what I what I see is you know the deepening divisions that are coming between the black man and the black woman. And I asked you to be my guest today because I respect you. I respect your opinions. And because there's not going to be any pandering here. There will not be. There will be no pandering. There shall be. No, we will have none of that. We shall have none of that. We will have respect. We will have respect. And we will have a good discourse. We will. But that's what I've said to you throughout the time that we spent together today preparing is that I know you are a person that is going to challenge me. And I wanted to come into this conversation to have a discourse with someone that is emotionally intelligent enough, committed to the same goal that I am, which is ultimately building, healing our community. And this is something that we each do in our own copious free time. You as an educator, touching certain elements of where the breakdown in the black community is affecting the youth. You know, me and my work with women and children as well. You know, we have differing opinions on things, but the goal remains unchanged. Right. And I know that we have enough respect for the work that each of us does and what we believe in to be able to approach this dialogue in a way where we will benefit from it. And hopefully other people who agree in different ways with our various <laughs> opinions, you know, we're not going to fix everything in one discussion, but I think we can definitely open up discussions that we can bring back to our different sex and that other people can hopefully, you know, comment, share, subscribe. Chime in to this conversation because this is an ongoing dialogue from 51 years ago. 51 years ago. A lot of the, the, the questions that we asked ourselves organically and naturally well, the same questions that they asked each other back then, same what? Right. And, you know, if, if, if it's the same now as it was then, as I said, it being constant. So the question is, why is it still there and has been there and continues to be there? Mm -hmm. If we, and if you look at each generation being 20 years, that's two going on three generations. Yes. Why are these problems still between not in our community, but between black men and black women. I think I think if I'm going to start at any place, it's education. We have been, you know, Lauren Hill said it best in the nineties, it's the miseducation of black people. And, you know, coming into the discussion that they were having in nineteen seventy one, fast forward into where we are now. We very rarely hear those discussions. We very rarely get the picture of what black life was like boots on the ground mm -hmm. in 1971 instead of the revisionist history of looking back on it and saying, this is my personal opinion, saying, um, <laughs> and this is where, we, where I'm going to start my work. Let's go. You know, of saying welfare took the black man out of the home. Um, you know, all of these societal factors, when, if you look at this discussion that they were having, we know that the realities of black life during that time, much like the realities of today, are not mirroring what media is saying about the black family. Hey, we'll take you back a little further. Quickly, you pulled in mm -hmm. the incomparable Lauren Hill and uh, miseducation of Lauren Hill, we'll go back a little further to the originator of that, mm -hmm. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, mm -hmm. miseducation of the Negro. So we're going back even further, and the problem was still the same. But the condition that, especially when it comes to education is, and I'll paraphrase, 
is if you convince <clears throat> if you convince someone that they are either inferior and in the and in the original sayings, if they are uh, a slave or they have to be fed through the back door mm -hmm. and they believe that for themselves, then they won't try to come through the front door. They will automatically go to the back door. And if there's not a back door, they will demand that you build one. Well, when we look at education, I was in a seminar where they discussed how the reading grades level was had been going down and had been below average for 17 years. Regardless of everything else that they had put in place, the reading level continued to go down for 17 years. Mm -hmm. That to me says there's a problem with the system. Yes. If there's a problem with the system, and this has been going on for more than a decade, again, probably the whole generation, then that means to me that it's benefiting somebody. Yeah. So who is benefiting from the miseducation of black children? Absolutely. But I think that's the place where we're constantly looking at the microcosm mm -hmm. of black life and not and not looking at our and not looking at the larger systems that are at work. Because here's the thing. We went away from having black schools, you know, integration comes in and now education is state funded. And now the state gets to decide what an educated child looks like. We know what these test scores, you know, we know what competition black children are being put into against white children. But now bring it back to the community level, people in our community who get, you know, angry about their kids being out of school, but you see it on a front hand level that a lot of them are not participating. They're not participants in their child's education. And that's not just black women. That's not just black men. But after about the third grade, these parents aren't even showing up at school. When we look at education, as far as parents being involved, we look at that third grade, and uh, I'm going to get the brother's name correct. Dr. Juwanza Kumjufu, you know, his books, Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. A new definition can resolve this problem. I'm not belittling money. You have to have money living in America, but that's not the criteria for manhood. Boys make babies, men take care of them. That's the definition. As well as, you know, an education with a pedagogy of from. Up until the third grade, students are taught to read, or they learn to read, but after the third grade, they read to learn. And we also know that at that time, black boys in the third grade, the lecture style doesn't work for them. They need movement. America has a problem. What do they do with the people they no longer need? But well, remember how you phrase the question determines the answer. The Negro question is, what are they going to do for us? The African question is, what are we going to do for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And within you, you said kinetic learning. Yeah, kinesthetic learning. They need kinesthetic learning. They need a little bit of movement. They they they, they need that. Whereas black girls, mm -hmm. they're more able to sit through a lecture, as are the white, white counterparts mm -hmm. of black boys. Yeah, but and let me caveat that. I think even a lot of that has to do with social engineering because white children were being educated when black children were not. When they were in fields picking cotton, mm -hmm. when they were labor class, and these white children for generations have parents who have, you know, they're able to be more um, hands-on with the educational process because they themselves have had higher levels of education. Right. And uh, another of the things we learned is that, you know, by a certain age, you'll have uh, black and brown kids who might have in their vocabulary reservoir, they know a thousand words. Meanwhile, their white counterparts will know 10,000 words. If you ever wonder why those reading tests are biased, this is the reason. Vocabulary. Vocabulary, as well as context. So, but here's, here's where I take issue with it. We understand that this is the systemic issue. Mm -hmm. However, 
if we do not put the educated black people back in the place to affect to be effectual in change towards these particular young black youths, then we're still going to continue to pass this on because we can honestly say that all of the I mean, this is my frustration when it comes to education. We still have black people who are the first blank, yeah. the first. And those people are coming off of generations of people like with the Black Panther Party where they were, where it was an educational system as well. The thing is with me, you dig, I, I need to know some more about it. I wish you had some more literature about the educational thing here. Because you dig, as far as we're concerned in, uh, in the struggle, the way we look at struggle is that uh, this depends on the educational thing, you dig. You know, they understood the need of the community of the black family to be the crux, the nexus of of where education flowed from. They would send their kids to school, but they would say to those kids, don't forget who you are. Remember what we taught you. You know, they would wake those kids up with affirmations and credos about where they came from. Like, yeah, your teacher's teaching you this, but here's the truth. We know that even those black educators that have this information, are not going to be allowed by the system to disseminate that information. So now the question becomes, we're, we're clearly failing educationally. I say the educational system is failing us. Absolutely. And, but it always has. Right. But, you know, some people will say that's by design. And, you know, I, I kind of agree with those people. So the question then becomes, how do we rectify? Go back to that hot topic, charter schools. Or taking control, and this is where parents come in, of the school in your community. Mm -hmm. Because they're doing that other places. Yeah. They're doing that where you cannot teach. You know, you, you, can, you, you can teach about a GI Bill when people went off to World War II. They came back, the soldiers were able to buy houses with the GI Bill. But I can't teach that those soldiers who came back from World War II who were black didn't get the same GI Bill to buy Houses and why? Right, but see, in order for you to affect the education system in your community, you would have to be brought into the community. You would have to be an invested community member. And that's the place where I would take it one step further. And like I said, this is your lane, but, you know, I think it helps to have people who are in the lane looking at it and people who are outside of it because I would take it one step further to say homeschool. Like, I do not believe that black people are able to harness enough community power to affect change on a level that large yet. We are going to have to send children from the home into the school armed with the information. They have to be radical and revolutionary enough to question the powers that be because as long as our children are underperforming, we don't really have a leg to stand on to say we should have even the schools in our community that, that cater towards educating them. You need to send the kids to school. Mm -hmm. Armed. Armed. Agreed. Armed. Two, you need to send them to a school that is going to sharpen and hone that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Both, which we had before desegregation, but we won't get to that tomorrow. That's true, because I will say that I think it throws you into a a state of cognitive dissonance to have the information mm -hmm. but be in a system that is consistently gaslighting you to believe that what you know to be true is not true. Who's Lawrence Dunbar? I have one face for me, one face for white folks to say. The mask. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. What well, you call code switching or code shifter. So we homeschool the kids. We send them someplace where and I say charter schools or education pods because right now the pandemic has shown us it can be done. It can be done. Right. But having that knowledge of self is what's going to, to make them successful. But here is the piece. In order to send those kids from home, mm -hmm. somebody has to teach them in the home. Absolutely. So parents also then have to learn. Yeah, parents have to be educated. They were seeing a whole generation, because at one point, 
At one point, Nikki Giovanni said everybody's dead. When we had that famous meeting with Bobby Kennedy, Lorraine said to Bobby, who was also dead, Everybody's dead. You know. You know, they were seeing a whole generation of their educators, leadership, being killed off. Right. We don't have that same, I mean, despite the amount of outrage that we do have, because we are seeing a lot of black people be, you know, state-funded execution, <laughs> state-funded execution style ended, but we we finally have the resources to be able to make so many of the dreams that they had then a reality. But it's like we live now in fantasy more than we live in reality because we have the economics here now to bring about these changes. But you see so many people, like we talk about defunding the police. We see so many people defunding you know, the black community, because a big part of having parents in the home available to educate children is an economic issue. Yes. And as we look at the economics of it, um, again, the pandemic showed us something else, that a lot of these go-in jobs, you don't have to go in for them. A lot of these so-called low-labor jobs or unskilled labor yeah, you need them more than you need the billionaire CEOs. And that's something that, a lesson that I'm hoping we don't unlearn. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the economics won't allow the parents to leave the house. Right. So what, what you have to do is, and this is the reason why I said charter schools or education pods. If you have five families and you have one person is here, this is the teacher at home, this is the homeschool teacher, or you have a homeschool federation, which they do have these groups of homeschools, and you have certified lesson plans, et cetera. Right. Then, yeah. Yeah, but see, that's that's the whole, that's the whole piece, though, is creating these communities. We have, because I, I want to make sure it's a black discussion, but I do love the fact that we are looking at actual viable solutions. Like you said, we have the technology now. We have a different way of thinking at th thinking of how we come at the problem instead of just blaming, you know, systemic racism and prejudice and bias that we have. However, we can't negate its effect on our ability to realize some of these things because I honestly feel that at this point we have come all the way to a place where if we do not capitalize on everything that we've suffered, learned, on every every place that we failed at and every one of our successes. Like if we don't find a way to come together, like when you're talking about these groups of schools, well, we've spent the last, of the last 51 years, I would say we spent the last 20 years deconstructing the black community, like what it is to be blackness. Like we really have like in God we trust, in white people we trust. Like we really have our heart set on competing with them in their arenas for their prizes. That's why we still have the first black, the first black, the first black. And we're like lauding that, but we're not using the first black to create the first black you know, homeschool federation. Because yeah. even once we go through the certification of those homeschooling curriculums, we still got to deal with the people that set what they feel like is education. We can be educating our children outside of that, but they still have certain fundamentals that they have to hit because we're still operating within the same system that was set up with what you say that was set up, as you say, by design. By design. So we looked at homeschool federations. We looked at charter schools. Mm -hmm. Those are two options. Mm -hmm. The community taking over public school. You had those dads, you had a bunch of fights in the school. The dad said enough. They went to start patrolling the halls. Yes, they did. Right? So the community can take over public school. They do. Okay. 
take it a step further. And no offense to everyone, because I, I undergrad PWI, <laughs> graduate degree, AT, Aggie Pride, but there should never be, never be a student, a person within walking or shouting distance of an HBCU who is illiterate. You go up the ladder, you have your HBCUs, and then those are going back in the community. Right. Because that was the circle. Right. Right? Right. And so that is the circle that has to happen again. And it has to happen because the community drives it. There's no amount of federal funding that's going to do it. It's going to have to be driven by a community who wants to be a community. Not people who want to block flight and leave, get right. rich and go. Right. You want to, you know, instead of leaving and buying a million dollar mansion, buy the hood. Right. But see, here's the thing. We are being led, and this is the place where I'm, I'm going to take the needle off the record. Because we, our leadership, our black, and you know me, male leadership are driving black flight. You know, it's the same trajectory that we've watched white supremacy be on. And now it has become the champion song of black people to say, I measure being able to have made it by my proximity to whiteness by how far away from the hood, the struggle, the kids, the community I can come because, you know, that's the exact thing that Jay-Z said on 444. I don't know how you're supposed to say that album, but 444, the album, he said, you know, if I knew then, like, I would have bought up Dumbo. I could have bought a place in Dumbo before it was Dumbo for like two million. Everything that we were being taught at that time said that if you are not amongst white people and we're and we're continuing to see that be lauded as black success, proximity to whiteness, then it, it, no amount of black capitalism, no amount of black millionaires, no amount of first this, first that seems to ever come back to now let's build the community. See, that would be socialism. Proximity to whiteness being considered making it. You are correct. We have to be standalone. Self-sufficient. Absolutely. We have to be at a point where it doesn't matter what awards you got. And this is the hard part. Even for, you know, enlightened poets and, and you know, all the other people, um, there's a sister named Mama Nita in, in Durham who she gave a workshop and she asked a question. And the question was, how do you stop a revolution? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, fund the revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. So if you look at people who are dependent on other people or other means to give themselves worth and value, then that will always be chains. Mm -hmm. Imagine if, and you know, yeah, Deion Sanders now going this, there's some things that, my, that I've said for a while that my friends have said. Imagine if all top black athletes went to HBCU. Absolutely. Imagine if top black athletes refused to play. Just that simple. Just that simple. What if top black celebrities refuse to go to, to to games. I mean, we could completely defund the NFL, defund the NBA. And, and the thing of it is, is that we don't boycott anymore. Mm -hmm. But if we were to take it on economically, right. this, this is economics. That's what it comes down to. Mr. I'm not going to touch socialism. Oh, but, <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But if we were to defund these institutions, the thing I consistently hear, like when NDRE talked about taking her music off of Spotify, what's this? when we talk about making these economic moves, it's to try to force the hand of white people. It's never 
about taking all this wealth that we required and actually rebuilding the systems that integration tore down and dismantled. It dismantled black power centers. Mm -hmm. But you brought up a good point that I want to make sure I put on my plaque, which is funding the revolution. Like a lot of people don't know that the March on Washington was supposed to look like that January 6th <laughs> insurrection, <laughs> but way and because black people was going to do it. You know, they had plans to go out to the airport and to lay on the tarmacs to keep the National Guard from being able to be flown in. Like, it was supposed to be a violent insurrection. I never heard of it. Yes, and that's what we're here to be, educated. They had it planned, booked, locked, stopped, barrel. They had the guns. It was not, they had the, the zip ties, what do they call them? The the flexi cuffs. They was ready to go up there and get my pants and hang them from the flagpole. But what happened was they, they got all that intel because we know how, you know, the FBI and, and, and Hoover and uh uh, the Kennedys, we, we know about all of that. And oddly enough, a big part of Kennedy's assassination came as a result of their compassion for this group of people. But they got all the intel about this million man march that was going on. And they said, listen, we can't stop it. But maybe if we can pacify the people, if we can make it peaceful. We'll, you know, we're we're gonna do the civil rights act. We're gonna do all this stuff that's in in word only, and and not gonna be in deed. But we will meet your demands that you have. And I'm gonna go somewhere with that. Don't let me forget. But they said we'll meet your little demands that you have. But you've got to make sure that these people are not violent, because Martin Luther King and the 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 Divine Six, whoever they were. They were not a part of these meetings that were going on. They were not a part of this movement, but they were funded by the Kennedys, by a lot of left wing, um, uh, you know, black compassionate groups yeah. to say, we will give you because see, people don't know the Nobel Peace Prize isn't a medal. It isn't, it isn't, you know, the medal of, of valor. These are not medals. These are monetary prizes. Eight hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and in that time, that's that's a lot of money for a mm -hmm. black person. You ain't winning no Nobel Peace Prize, baby. And so they had given them the six they had given they had pledged them like over a million dollars that they were gonna split between the six of them and they gave them half of it up front. And they would give them the other half after they had, uh, you know, successfully quelled the insurrection and made it a peaceful march. So the person that outed all that information, they got all that information from the meeting that he had with Martin Luther King. And they both had decided to go public with this information was Malcolm X. That's why they killed him first. I have not ever heard that. I will have to do some research. Bullets and speeches. He has did. That's what I'm saying about we don't go back to the information that's already been there because they were funding Martin Luther King. They were giving him all the white women he could enjoy. And it's such a sensational thing because they martyred him and they made a hero out of him so that we would always look up to him instead of Malcolm X because we don't want by any means necessary black people. We want turn the other cheek, love your neighbor, little black boys and girls, you know, little little black and white boys and girls in the in the in the classroom together narratives because this is what is diluting black nationalism. This is what's keeping us tied to plantation systems like the NFL. Like you said, you got more black men in the NFL, more black millionaires in the NFL anywhere else. No owners. He's been Medgar, Malcolm. Yes. Um. Muhammad. And, and you can go to, you can bring your Kennedys in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, we had 
those leaders and they were killed. Yeah. And earlier you were talking about, you know, black leadership, particularly black male leadership today. And the mm-hmm. question would be, who are the black male leaders? Of today. Of today. All right, Wi-Fi, thank you for sticking around until the very end of this episode. This concludes part one of the two-part conversation with Elliot Axiom, leading off on the question, who are the black male leaders of today? We will answer that question and pick back up next week. Same bat time, same bat station. If you haven't already, you can go ahead and subscribe to my channel by clicking this link right here. And if you like this content, you might be interested in this episode right here. But until the next episode, be unplugged, unbothered, and unleashed. You're not niggas.